Hey, what's up, ecosystem? Welcome back to ATI, the car shipping business channel. My name is Jay. It is Wednesday. It is noon central time. That means it is time for some DOT compliance with your DOT guy, Brian Riker. What we ask you to do is go ahead and jump in the live chat, say hello, ask questions. What's up, Ty? Devin? Brian's in the live chat also. Uh, David at Two Bears. Hey, what's going on? Ants Transportation. Thank you guys so much for saying hello in the live chat. I uh, really do appreciate it. You know, uh, what I ask you to do, do me a favor. Go ahead and leave a like. And remember, you can skip ahead if you're watching on demand. You don't have to do that. Click share, click copy, grab that YouTube link, send it to a friend that's, you know, maybe they got, uh, maybe they got their paperwork screwed up. How's that gonna how's that gonna go next week? Huh? Brian can talk about it. Um, go to autotransportintel.com, click on sign up, become an ATI insider, prevent a problem, and protect your CDL. That's what we want to help you do. So here we go. You know what? It's worth it. Um, we are happy to have our premier coach here. Your DOT guy, Brian Riker. Brian, can you see me and hear me okay? Howdy, Jay. Howdy, everybody. That is one heck of an introduction, especially <laughs> with the drum roll. <laughs> I mean, it's a little three ring, but um, three ring binder, maybe, huh? Well, that's what we need, man. The The rule book is over a thousand pages thick anymore. Come on. And, wow. And it's getting harder every day. I, I just completed the sign-up process to be a entry-level driver training provider, uh, which, as you may be aware, starting February 7th, so just next week, you won't be able to sit for your, which they, they use the word sit, and it's so stupid. You won't be able to take your CDL skills or road test if you have not completed entry-level driver training. And, well, I just completed the process because I've been a driving instructor for 30 years now. And, and my book for it is 714 pages thick for what the curriculum needs to cover for a full Class A license. So, that yeah, the FMCSA, they love their regulations. Wow. Um, I shared the link to the entry-level driver training in case, you know, in case you're new here. We welcome that. You know, there are no stupid questions. This is your opportunity to ask what you would think would otherwise be a stupid question around your friends at the Fuel Island. You know, you can't ask that stuff. But here, this is a safe place and Brian wants to help. Um, so let's do this because we have several things and plus we're going to add Ty at the end of the show I believe Ty is at an auction with Hendrick. Let me check the live chat. Um, let's see. Ant says, I got my, my bow tie and tux ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Um, let's see. Otherwise, I don't think I see any questions. Okay, cool. So let's do this. Let's go to the news of the day. Uh... I don't know. If this, is this news? Is Groundhog <laughs> news? I don't know. We've been stuck in Groundhog Day for the last 700 and some days since uh, 14 days to flatten the curve. Oh, wait. I'm not going to get political. <laughs> oh. But yes. <laughs> right? Six, no, I, six I, more weeks of winter. Sure. Yeah. But otherwise, it would have been six weeks till spring. So I, I, I love this. Now, this is my home state of Pennsylvania, oh, yeah. so I can't pick on it too bad. <laughs> Now, now, sadly, there's a groundhog in Florida that does the same thing, and he passed away just before Groundhog's Day. So I guess Florida is going to be stuck in the eternal deep freeze. It's funny. I was thinking about you know, and then, and then when they were reading, I watched the video, and they're reading it, and the groundhog's just sitting there patiently. The whole thing, I find the whole thing's just confusing, but I suppose, you know, given all the crazy changes, a little bit <laughs> of throwback to ye old times. We got to have a good time once yeah. in a while. So, yeah, hey, cool. th this town has found a way to take a road and make a fortune off of it because <laughs> so many people go visit Puxatawney for this Groundhog Day ceremony. It's known around the world. They, they license the groundhog's likeness and everything. This little town found a way 
without taxing its residents to generate a significant chunk of revenue that helps everybody. So you got to yeah. love it. And it was today is two, 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 right? Captain obvious. But I wondered if that increased, you know, 10% reservations. I don't know. <laughs> um, of course, speaking of, uh, well, there's a stump. Hey, Groundhog has a stump, and David's got a stump. We bet you can't stump, Brian. We welcome your uh, questions. Yeah, the Truckers Unite thing is happening. When is that, by the way? That is happening now. Is now In fact, now? Uh, Canadian authorities have dispatched police to help break up the uh, and help break up the protest and the blockade, the blockade at the Canadian border. Uh, they definitely know how to organize up there and, and right or wrong, whether you believe in their cause or the vaccine or no vaccine mandate, etc. I got to give them props for getting together and getting behind something that they believe in and doing something. It, it, it wasn't just talk. They, they had a thousand or more trucks show up to block the border. So they definitely got attention to their uh, to their cause. There's a question in the live chat. Um, wait a minute, let's do this. There's two uh, in the live chat. Question. Okay. Oh, there is two. Oh, okay. Can a can a Canadian driver drive for a U.S. company? Yes. Short answer is yes. Just like a U.S. driver can drive for a Canadian company, there are some rules, and I'm not an expert on this, so you need to get with an expert that does cross border trucking. But you see all the time Canadian based companies hiring Arizona based drivers, so they would be U.S. And it can work the other way. Our driver's licenses are considered equivalent, so there's just a, a few hurdles to jump. It's going to depend on whether you are living in the United States, then you'd need a work visa, or if you're just engaging in cross-border trucking. Short answer is it can be done, but it's not as simple as just submitting an application and start driving for them. And, of course, I put in the live chat, you can email your DOT guy on air at your DOT guy if you have a question, if you want to have a follow-up consultation or otherwise. Okay, Brian, question. If I get prescribed medicine for sleeping problems... Can I somehow get in trouble? Also, which medicine is prohibited? Yes, you could get in trouble if you're taking a medicine that your DOT doctor, so whoever issues your medical card, doesn't sign off on as acceptable. So the way you could get in trouble, let's say you're prescribed a sleeping pill, and when you go for your next medical exam, there's a question about medications you're taking. If you don't list it and then discuss it with the medical examiner and then it's discovered you're on this, um, you could get in trouble. So if it's not listed and you're a CDL driver, you take a drug test and it comes up in your drug test result and it's one of the prohibited drugs, then you could get in trouble. The list of prohibited medicine isn't broke down in plain English either, where we can say Xanax is bad, but z is good. So this is a question for your DOT doctor. And if you're concerned about them wanting to pull your medical card, I suggest you just call a random DOT doctor, talk to them, discuss with them over the phone about the medicine you're taking. And sometimes it can be authorized if you get a note from your primary care physician saying they understand you operate a commercial motor vehicle and they feel that this medicine will not interfere with that. And then your DOT doc signs off on it. Generally, if it's not on the Schedule 1 list of prohibited substances, so it's not a methamphetamine, a narcotic, uh, I forget the rest of them off the top of my head, but if it's not on Schedule 1, then you normally can get away with taking it. But that's a question best answered by your DOT doctor. Well, and my guess would be that, uh, yeah, you're uh, getting stopped. You're arguing over the ELD. Oh, hey, you got a, do we know about that pill well, bottle right there? Well, that's exactly the point, Jay, because A, I see a lot of drivers make a mistake and we do it for convenience. We'll take our prescription medicines and we'll dump them in one of them weekly organizers so we don't screw up when we take them. 
that's fine, but you still have to carry the original prescription pill bottle with you or a copy of the prescription to prove that you lawfully should have that medicine in your possession. And if it's in plain sight or discovered during a search of your cab, and remember, a commercial motor vehicle, even when you're using it as a sleeper and you're living in it, has no reasonable expectation of privacy. So motor carrier enforcement can search that truck, like it or not, anytime they want to. They use some... Uh, I don't want to say false pretense, but they search it to check for compliance, and that allows them to do it. Uh, in fact, in some states, you specifically sign permission to allow that to happen when you obtain your commercial driver's license or your commercial vehicle registration. So long story short, if you're using a prescription medicine, make sure your doctors have signed off on it, that it's okay to use as a truck driver. Even if you're not worried about DOT discovering it and getting a citation, Heaven forbid you're involved in a crash and then a drug test is drawn after the scene because a lot of states will order that, especially in a severe crash, and plaintiff counsel discovers you're on a prohibited substance. Now you're going to pay for these injuries even when they're not your fault and or if the enforcement discovers you're on a prohibited substance, you may even end up with a criminal charge. So. Well, we need to still earn a living and protect our ability to earn that living. We need to protect our ability to remain free and able to work, even if it's not in our chosen field as a driver. So you really do need your doctor's consent on any of these. Man, oh, man, what a what a sweat fest. Um, hey, by the way, I just want to welcome Danny B and Chris Chamberlain. Silver Min is here. What's going on? Sideshow, the producer made it in. What's happening? I just want to, you know, uh, it seems to me, you know, the question is, what's the difference between a cubicle and an office building and the cab of your truck? The cab of the truck is because you are a highly regulated business entity. That is a term they use to violate your most basic of civil rights. That's also what allows them to show up unannounced and knock on your office door when you're a motor carrier, even when that office is at your house and demand to see your records and inspect your records and your safety management processes. When you click I certify and you apply for your USDOT authority, you grant them permission to do that. It's one of the lines in there that allows them to show up at any time and inspect your facilities and records. So you waive your rights when you decide to enter the highly regulated world of motor carrier transportation as a commercial vehicle owner and or operator. And that's how they do it legally. The show's giving me the willies today. Uh, let's just keep moving. See if we can find some good news here. Oh, hey, how we doing? It is now time. Here we go. Let's cue up the music. All right. It is now time. We're going to look at proper load distribution of trailer weight. And do not be the flip of the week. There's no reason to do that. Well, I mean, there could be, but if you can avoid it, we see it out there. This is a, isn't that picture is a doozy, isn't it? I found that yesterday. Yes, it is. And I think it sums up what we're trying to, you know, because it, it, that is a, I think that's a dually, and I think that's a wedge. Am I right? That's kind of what it looks like to it's me. It's hard to yeah. tell, though. I know it's hard <laughs> to tell. It's a bunch of scrap metal right now. Yeah, but I'm, yeah. So anyways, um, we've got, let's see, here's one. Oh, hey, this might be the, the before and after. So... <laughs> Devin is cruising down, was a Virginia I-95, and... Oh, I-66. I-66, okay. We got one. We have a potential... I mean, nothing's happened. Everything could be just fine. But what's the problem, Brian? The manufacturers of these wedge-style trailers recommend you do not load a vehicle all the way forward at the highest point of the trailer until you have other vehicles on the trailer to help with stabilization, center of gravity, and balance. What we have in this picture for those of you, excuse me, for those of you in podcast land, we have a dually cabin chassis, 
pulling a three car wedge. This is a rather low profile wedge, so it's not as bad as some of them that I've seen. But this is a three car Kaufman. He has a newer Jeep Wrangler loaded all the way up front. Beautiful securement job. Four over the wheel straps exactly the way they're supposed to be. No front overhang. The truck looks like it's more than adequate for the job he's asking out of it as a three car hauler. So I give him a lot of points for that. But if you look specifically to Kaufman, this manufacturer, they don't recommend loading a single vehicle in that position until you have other vehicles on the trailer. They would rather see that down the back of the trailer, closer to being over the dual axles on the trailer. It only changes center of gravity by a foot or two, but that could make the difference in their opinion for a rollover. Now, that said... There are some valid reasons to load this trailer the way that it's loaded as well. When you put all the weight on the back of your trailer like that, if they're equal to or behind your drive axle, now you're unloading the uh, tongue of the trailer. So where it attaches to your hitch. In this case, we have a, uh, a fifth wheel hitch is what it looks like over the drive axle of the truck. And so you're going to lift up on that lighten the drive axle of the truck a little bit and as soon as you get into slippery roads you might end up with an understeer condition leading to a jackknife so there's two schools of thought about loading it this way for weight distribution he's probably better with it all the way up front but for center of gravity it should be closer to the middle or uh, rear of the trailer about where the tandem axles are and now I see that uh, Victory Lap is uh, oh. commenting in our comments, and he was saying that the trailer was rocking back and forth, and that is exactly what will happen when you have that much weight up high and nothing else on the trailer. You're going to have an unstable trailer. The, the conventional understanding from trailer manufacturers is to load approximately 60% of the weight forward, 40% to the rear. When you only have one vehicle like this on the trailer, you've loaded 100% of the weight to the front. So it should slide back down. Uh, uh, the, the load should be further back, maybe halfway between the truck and the tandem axles on the trailer for uh, weight distribution when it's empty like this. Overall, this isn't the worst case of high center of gravity that I have seen. The Mini 5 trailers and four, the Mini 4 and 5 trailers are much worse. Uh, this one could be worse, too, if it was a wedge that had an extension that went up over the cab of the truck, adding another two or three feet to the center of the gravity. But this will cause that condition that Devin noted while he was driving down the road. Uh, we've also got unsecured uh, sunglasses. Well, I can yell at him, too, for taking the picture while he's driving. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, nah, <laughs> nah, we'll skip it. Let's keep moving. Okay. Uh, what else we got here? Okay, that's right. Remember how we were saving for a house, honey? Well, surprise. I love you so much that I want you to start a trucking company with me. Um, let's go into some of this. Uh, so here you are. You're gathered around the kitchen table. And you're cleaning up after dinner and you're reading the news. UCR fees decline by 27%. Is this is this a big deal? Um, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. Um, the UCR fees, fees declining by 27%. That means that next year you'll pay 27% less for your unified carrier registration. UCR is something that shouldn't even happen in the first place. This is a holdover from the old single state registration system, which was a holdover from the days before we had digital databases where states and motor carrier officers could instantly validate your insurance. The whole purpose of the unified carrier registration is to make sure you have proper insurance on file, which is evidenced by having a U.S. DOT number that is current. Uh, they could look the same information up in the same time by querying the SAFER system uh, that the FMCSA database maintains. But long story short, it's a money grab. The states use this money to fund uh, enforcement programs for motor carrier enforcement. So your UCR fees pay your sa pay the salary of the part of the salary of the motor carrier enforcement programs in each state. So 
at least you're giving them a 27 percent less money next year and this isn't they're doing us any favors they're required by regulation to evaluate the fees every year and there's a cap on how much money they're allowed to collect with the system and because we've had such an increase in the number of motor carriers that register we're, we're adding something like i think it's five or six thousand new motor carriers every month right now in the united states uh so with the number of new motor carriers on the road paying into this system they exceeded the amount of money they're allowed to collect this is the third time in the last five or six years that these fees have actually reduced hmm. interesting context there uh what's going on with diesel brian it's going up in cost uh, um, part of this is because we're at the new year and several states have raised their motor fuel taxes to generate more money and i hate to say it but i hope their fuel taxes stay high because some of these other some of these states have said well now that we're getting a whole bunch of federal money we're going to reduce our fuel taxes which sounds great save a few pennies but it defeats the purpose of the new infrastructure bill of putting extra money into our highways and bridges to bring them up to to at least a b or c level because right now we have d level infrastructure our our infrastructure is failing all across this country so part of that is why fuel is going up because we need to collect more money to maintain our highways and bridges the increase in fuel economy means we sell less fuel so less money comes in electric fuel vehicles mean less money is collected through this mechanism and part of this is political because we have shifted our production back out of the United States. We're relying on imported oil. We're having a crisis at the Russian Ukrainian border that has led to speculation in the market to increase prices. So there, there's no one answer why it's going up. It sucks that it's going up for those of us in the auto transport world because we don't generally have fuel surcharges. Our brothers and sisters in the freight world are loving this because their fuel surcharges automatically adjust in most of their contracts uh, to follow fuel up and down. So it doesn't matter to them what fuel costs per gallon. They're still going to make enough, the same net at the end of the day to haul that load. Uh, Usage-based insurance for owner-operators small fleets. Anything interesting here? This concept is... You may have seen the advertisement for Progressive and a couple of the other ones for your personal car where you put the little chip in your USB port and they uh, will rate your policy based on how well you drive, how often you drive. This is a great insurance if you don't do a whole lot of miles or you do a lot of miles in an area that is low risk and then the insurance company can – adjust your risk based on where you actually operate instead of where they guess you operate because of your address and what you told them. I caution that if you haven't been completely forthcoming with your insurance company about your true operations, if you were to switch over to something like this, you may actually see an increase in your insurance premium if they find that your uh, uh, not doing what they expected you to do but generally usage-based insurance should be a little bit less expensive presuming you are what they consider a good driver operating in the areas that they say you're operating in and jump through all their other tech hurdles to comply for these type of programs yeah it's interesting it's a real test of one's honesty uh on the on that kind of stuff and we'll keep going here um broken lights top violation for north american truckers you see that is that something it, it, that it makes sense uh and they these are highlighted in the cold weather and the inclement weather when we have uh, snow and salt and stuff uh but that that makes sense because a lot of people don't think of the light being out as a real safety issue. So, okay, I got a light out. I still have to go. I don't have time to deal with this today. I'm going to go. Well, a light out is a low-hanging fruit violation, as I call it. It's something that's visible. Any motor carrier enforcement officer can see that and decide that they're going to cite that 
or they're going to cite that at least as a warning, if not a ticket, as the reason to pull you over so that then they can check your logbook and your manifest or bill of lading and do a more detailed inspection of your truck. So that's what they look for. Uh, so, yeah, this makes perfect sense that it is the top violation. A, trucks have so many lights on them. They're hard to maintain with the salt that's on the road. It gets in and corrodes your wires, and they're not top of mind for us to fix. Plus, your lights could be perfect when you did your pre-trip inspection in the morning. Then you hit the road, and they go out. They come and go and flicker as you're driving down the road. It is very difficult to maintain your lights in 100% working order 100% of the time. Hey, uh, this just in, Ty is at an auto auction and wants to say hello. So go ahead and jump in the live chat. We've got a few more minutes here. We're going to check in with Ty. And, um, oh, he's, a, he's in the live chat, too. He's in the live chat. He's in the Zoom. Ty, what's going on, man? Uh, it's a little windy. I don't know if you can hear me, but excited because you know every friday i'm in the transport parking lot at america's auto auction kansas city missouri today thanks brian by the way mj for letting me on i'm in the transport parking lot at america's auto auction georgia atlanta and i found a guy loading cars check it out can you see it yeah yeah so big bridge right oh it was a three-car wedge So, yeah, where are you again? You're at America's Auto Auction? Oh, here we go. Uh-oh. Same them. Same them. Yeah. Because, you know, that's, that's a little bit different for us okay. to speak Spanish. This is Hendrick. Hi, Che. And this is um, Luis. Luis? Yeah, you are. Luis yeah. from Orlando. Orlando. Orlando, Florida. With the high rail car trail. Beautiful truck. Absolutely. He's Gorgeous. educating us a lot about what you do. You yeah. train, so you use a, have a dispatcher? Yeah, I have a dispatcher. And you have a, they use slow board. And you do new car too, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 95% new cars. 95%. Yeah. Through yeah. a broker maybe? Yeah, I got a my dispatcher move with a couple brokers. Um, the Nissan, the Nissan. Kia, Kia, Mercedes, uh, Mercedes. Uh, GNC. GMC. GMC. Yeah, GMC. 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 This is Jay. Remember I told you the YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's the a, guy that started it. Yeah, he, yeah. he sent to oh, me Oh, he's been telling you? Yeah, no, he sent to me the original yeah. oh. YouTube channel. Okay. Like, Good. I anyway. passed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is, um, one more time, what was your name? Louis. Louis. Yes. Louis. Louis, Louis okay. from Orlando. Louis from Remember, what's the name of your the company? We'll it's an Imperial Auto Care. Imperial Auto Care. Auto Care. So you would be what we call owner operator. Yeah, I own the operator. Owner operator. So you own the truck, the trailer. Yeah. You do all the work. It's very easy to understand who is owner operator and who is not. If you look at the truck here, clean. It's clean. Yeah, it's a normal. And it's <laughs> very simple to understand. This is the guy. This is the guy. <laughs> He's clean. Look yeah. at him. He's clean. Beautiful. Everything. Let's he has white shoes show on. How, yeah, white <laughs> shoes and they're still white. <laughs> Hold on. Look at this. Check this out. Look how clean this truck is. Wow. See it? Wow, that's nice. Beautiful. Yeah. It's clean. Okay, yeah. so if you Looks turn around good. this way. No, not that way. This way. He's got every light working. Oh, there's America's. What city are you in? Uh, Atlanta. 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 Yeah. Did Brian say Atlanta. Is Brian still here? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. Oh, hey, Brian. Sorry to cut in on you. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm very Busted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> So, uh, what I like about auctions is it's kind of the same no matter where you go, right? So, you got your transport parking lot, you got your building. Oh, look, we got check in and guard check. I always talk about guard check. What do you need to know about the guard check? You need to know that these guys can either help you or hurt you. Donuts and coffee. Hang on, let me see if they're still here. 
they can either hurt you or help you. God, it's funny. This is the guard shack. Remember I told you my buddy? Yes. There he is right there. This is the guard shack, and this is where I tell people you got to be nice. Right, right. If you're not nice to these guys, you're not getting a car. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys transporting? Full operations, right? Like, that place is busy. They've got stuff. Oh, we're hey, we're at 1230, Ty, so let's do this. We're losing internet, and we're going to, uh, we're going to, we got line down, Ty, so let's do this. We're going to let you, we're going to say goodbye to you guys, and we're going to let you go. But Ty, thank you. Thank yeah. you for checking in. That was cool. I like this. Now, you're headed to Florida. Are you going to be in Florida Friday? Yeah, Jacksonville. Candy. Okay. So anybody that's in our gang, if they want to meet us at uh, Candy's place on Friday around noon, yeah, we're going to have a party. All right. I got the link in the live chat. Please do jump in Friday on Cars in the Move. Ty will be in Florida. We're going to be saying hello to Candy. And also, there was a load board question earlier. Please jump in tomorrow on Dispatching Live. Ty, thank you, buddy. We'll see you Friday. Maybe we'll see you tomorrow, too. I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> See you, Ty. See you, Andrew. All right, so I put it back, and uh, let's do this, Brian. Um, let's make sure. Let's share the. We got. I have. I had some other stuff here. Like, uh, have, let's do this. We'll do this real quick, so I don't have to keep moving. Go the for next it. Week. The the bridge, the billions to bridge repairs. Well, we need that. In my home state of Pennsylvania, we had that bridge collapse in Pittsburgh the other day that made national news. I know, when he was there, right? Yeah, yeah he, he was scheduled to be there in just a couple of hours. And, and what upsets me about that bridge, and this is where I was going earlier on the fuel price rant, and I got a little off track. We need to stop diverting our infrastructure money away from highways and bridges and hard infrastructure. Uh, we do need to fix other things in this country. But when we have bridges that collapse randomly with buses and cars and stuff on them, an occupied bus, uh, uh, that's a problem, especially considering that bridge had been rated as a D minus uh, as far back as 2014 or 15 and it had money earmarked to do critical structural repairs and from what i understand from a couple of local news reporting agencies that money had been diverted to a bike and rail track trail project instead of fixing the bridge and all they did is reduce the weight limit to 27 tons instead of fixing the bridge and that is just completely unacceptable in the greatest country in the world is to have infrastructure that literally falls out from under its users you know and what's really frustrating um is that then there's an investigation and la 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 the, the number of investigations happening at any one time must be mind-boggling. Oh, sure. Can't, uh, sure can't do the right thing at the beginning. We've got to have an investigation. And staying on topic here, we have all this money that's been set aside legislatively for critical infrastructure repair. But because we keep passing in congress we keep passing continuing resolutions that's just kicking the can down the road that's allowing agencies to only spend under their current authorization levels that means all these billions of dollars that congress has said yes you can use to fix your bridges and your roads the state can't get them from the federal government until Congress passes an actual new appropriations bill and says, yes, we can write that check and you can spend that money. So this money was earmarked to go to shovel ready projects. So the money should have been there this coming spring. But because our congressmen and women cannot get their act together and pass a bipartisan appropriations bill, something is one of the only things that they're actually mandated they must do on time and they haven't done on time in years is the appropriations bill they can't do it and so then we have all this money sitting there that we can't even spend to address problems like this before the next bridge collapses uh so then i, I was thinking this terrible joke about biden is the mothman let's just keep going <laughs> sure yeah 
let's see here. Oh, uh, we're still doing this. Or are we? Where are we? They're still working on Washington State is trying to increase truck parking, which is a wonderful thing, and require shippers and receivers that have trucks pick up and deliver to provide restroom access. Now, I'm hoping the restroom access becomes something more than just a porta potty because it can get pretty cold and awful in a porta potty, but it's a start because in most of the country, they're allowed to treat us like animals and they're not even required to give us access to a restroom. So, that, that's a positive bill. Nothing important has uh, changed on that one yet. Ouch. Um, let's not forget that you can tune in to On the Road with your DOT guy, Brian Riker. Brian, please tell us a little bit more about your podcast. Sure. This podcast is a pre recorded, so it doesn't have a live chat. It's not on YouTube. It's available most places where you can get your podcast. Uh, so Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Media. Uh, um, Google Play. It's supposed to be on iTunes, but we're having a problem with that. But if you can't get it on your favorite podcast platform, just go to www.yourdotguy.com, click on the podcast. And if you hit the subscribe link, A, it'll take you to a couple places you can subscribe, but B, it'll also take you to all of the current episodes, all six of them. The new episodes drop every Saturday. The most recent one is a conversation with Jeffrey Godwin of FTI Groups. They're a division of Arc Best, and they provide a free uh, road service dispatch service application to the owner operator to help you find road service for your truck in the unlight in the unfortunate event that it breaks down. Uh, the one that's going to be coming out this Saturday is just me with some thoughts on insurance and checking your insurance coverage because we know the used truck market's gone crazy. Used truck prices are up 67% and maybe you haven't adjusted your declared value with your physical damage insurance or maybe you don't even have physical damage. That's what started this whole this week's upcoming podcast was a client of mine had a uh, a, a truck burn up and now they're stuck facing a $30,000 recovery bill and they didn't have physical damage, so it wasn't an accident. The truck just caught on fire from a mechanical defect, and their insurance isn't paying this bill. So I, I challenge you to think about your insurance in this week's episode and check to make sure you have the appropriate coverages for it. And that is your DOT on the road with your DOT guy, Brian Riker. Um, awesome, man. You know, I've got a couple other things here. We'll try to – maybe we'll try to – if you got a couple minutes. I've, I have time for you, you today, time. Jay. Right. I'm in the office today. I'm not yeah. on the road. All right, good. Um, I saw this. I think I, I got this on LinkedIn, how to prepare for a DOT audit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just thoughts. Uh, do you put stuff like this out? What do you, you know, I'm, what goes I'm to getting... your mind when you see this? Yeah. I... I have not seen this specific – actually, I have seen this article. I have. You're, um, this article is actually pretty well written, and I wish I had time to put stuff like this out. I, I'm ready to hire an administrative assistant to help me keep up with all of this. Uh, those of you to reach out through on air at yourdotguy.com or call uh, – you may notice it takes me a little while to get back to you. I apologize for the delays, but right now, Fleet Compliance Solutions and your DOT guy is just me, myself, and I. I may have multiple personalities, but that doesn't mean I can get three times the work I, done. I know all about it. In fact, like, Top 12 Load Boards 2022 literally happened live on the air because I don't have <laughs> extra time to work on that stuff. So I've turned sure. live shows into... But what I to, I'm glad you brought this up, though, Jay, like that article, which is a well-written article. And a lot of our audience probably receive emails from J.J. Keller and Foley Services and companies like them that are competitors of mine. I hope to create that type of content both on social media, so Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on, as well as I am launching a YouTube channel to run in conjunction and parallel with yours not take away from anything we do here at ati but i'm hoping to put up short little three to five minute training videos on these topics that'll give you enough information that because this is my theory 
I love to have you all as customers. I offer a subscription program for the independent owner operator at $195 a month where I'm here to answer your questions in real time, almost 24 hours a day. If it's a true emergency, then 24 hours a day. But I want to teach you. I have the heart of a teacher, and I want to teach you enough about this that really I make myself obsolete, and you can do it on your own because just about everything you need to do to maintain and manage your trucking company and compliance, you can do yourself with little to no cost, or you can hire a professional to do it for you. I just don't want you to get roped into where you have no idea what they're doing and you don't know if they're doing the right thing for you or you don't even know what has to be done and that company goes out of business and now you're in trouble. I want you to at least know that you can do this, what needs to be done, and then decide whether it's more convenient just to pay somebody to do it for you. So my goal for 2022 is to create some of these short educational videos, such as preparing for a DOT audit. Because for those of you out there that are thinking about starting a trucking company, when I do a new uh, DOT authority package for you, I include audit support for your first mandatory new entrant audit you're going to get in the first 18 months. And... I would love to make part of that an online YouTube video. I'd love to share that to be available for everyone else just as a thank you for being part of this industry that has supported us all so well over these years. I'm trying to, let's see, where did I get this? Because uh, Devin asked in the live chat. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I know it came from LinkedIn, but I don't yeah. know the URL resource for okay. that article. Um, and let's see if we can find his name. This was published on January. It's called How to Prepare for a DOT Audit. Samuel Tucker. And I'm going to try to... I'm trying to Google right now. I'm Googling live. LinkedIn, How to Prepare for a DOT Audit. Samuel Tucker. Let's see if I can... Samuel Tucker, CEO. Okay, and I did find him. How to Prepare... Oh, I think I might have found it here. Here comes the link. <laughs> prepare. Let's see. Prepare article. And I think I found it. All right, cool. Um, let's see. I got a few more. How about... Here's another one. High Mount Overhang. And I like this because you can read, you can see the conversation. What is the federal <laughs> overhang law for high mounts? That's an old thread on Trucker's Report. I may even have replied in it's okay, that thread. I, you know there what? I there, am. There's you, there yeah. I am. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> so my answer will not have changed because right. it depends on and your overall short. length. No. Look at that. <laughs> the, the, the short answer for high mount is there is no federal overhang allowance unless you qualify under the definition of automobile transporter which requires you to be able to carry a motor vehicle as cargo on the power unit, meaning your truck. So in layman's terms, you have to have a head rack that allows you to load at least one car on your tractor if you're going to hook up to a high mount, which is a traditional fifth wheel automobile trailer, to qualify. Then you would be allowed three foot off the front of your tractor, four foot off the rear of your tractor. Federal law does not make any reference to the overhang off the front of the trailer, so between the truck and trailer. And this is where it gets very difficult to comply. That rule is so old that they limit you to 65 foot bumper to bumper, so front of your tractor to rear of trailer is a minimum length of 65 foot which was a gift when that rule was first written and 53 foot trailers were not allowed. But now it's a hindrance because your average 53 foot high mount and your average sleeper equipped road tractor are closer to 75 plus foot long. And so some states literally interpret that, that, all right, we have a conventional automobile transporter, 65 foot head rack. Okay. They're good. You can't comply with that in about half the states. So Unfortunately, the conventional fifth wheel high mount automobile trailer is not really useful if you're going to have overhang and run irregular routes across the country. It's the same rule that applies to your 
pickup truck and trailer in the hot shot world, your wedges and similar trailers, they're, they fall under the same rules as a flatbed would with a divisible load. The state says it becomes a state issue, not a federal issue. And they say, well, just drop a car off and now you can be legal. We don't care if you're making money or not. <laughs> How was that for an answer? Oh, John? man, that is this. I mean, really, this show would. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would make you crazy. It would make you crazy wondering what you got into. Like, for example, here's a question. Is an if to audit painful? It can be. It can be, Ants. Uh, the IFTA audit is every bit as serious as an IRX tax audit because IFTA is a tax. And these are no sense of humor. These are not the same guys that are going to come out and do your motor carrier audit where they're a half-retired highway trooper who understands how to talk to people and is there to educate you. And if the audit is a tax auditor and they're an accountant and they only know numbers. And if it doesn't add up, then there is no explaining it. You failed to follow procedure. So yes, if you don't have what they require and you can find out exactly what the problem uh, procedure is going to be and exactly what they require. It's not secret information, but if you don't have what they require, uh, the penalties are just like failure to properly file and pay your income taxes. They can get expensive, uh, up to a hundred percent of the tax that is due plus penalties and interest and such. Uh, but if you want to find out exactly what the process is for an if to audit, you go to IFTA's official website, I-F-T-A-C-H dot O-R-G. We've had this link on the show in the past, I-F-T-A-C-H dot O-R-G. Then there's a link for manuals, and you download the IFTA audit manual. I think it's 30 or 50 pages, and it shows the exact process their auditor is going to use. This is the book they use to teach their auditors. Uh it shows exactly what they're going to look for. Basically, they're going to take a couple of your trips and run them through the Pro Miles software to see if the miles that that computer says are close to the miles that you claim. And if they're within reason, 5 to 10%, then they're just going to make sure you purchased enough fuel. They're going to grab some fuel receipts and make sure that they match up to the numbers you've claimed on your report. They'll do this for a handful of trips. If they find a couple of them that are all good, they walk away. If they find a problem in the first couple of trips, then they're going to dig into every trip you've done in the reporting period and uh, look for every penny possible that they can recover. I lost your audio, Jay. Check, check, Mike, two, there you one, are. two. Okay, here we go. Auto Transport Intel, DOT Compliance, Jay's Audio, take two. Hey, it was you this time, not yeah, me. Yeah, it was I... me. <laughs> <laughs> how a plaintiff's attorney's shop works and how truckers can play defense to work it. This is an interesting article, and this is an area where I work. I am not an attorney. We've said that many, many times. I am not an attorney. However, I do do some expert witness work uh, defending truckers and tow companies and tow truck operators and such. And this is an interesting piece on how those billboard ambulance chasing attorneys work and what they're looking for. Uh, basically, this is what I was getting at earlier when we were talking at uh, the top of the show about uh, prescription drugs and not declaring them and not having a doctor sign off that they're allowable. That's one of many pieces that a plaintiff counsel is going to look for because they have an unlimited amount of money. If they think they're right and they know that we carry a million dollars in coverage, so they know that even if they're wrong, the insurance company is probably going to offer them a percentage of your policy, 20 percent, so 200 grand just to shut up and go away. Since they know that they've got at least a million dollars to work with, they spare no expense with hiring private investigators and folks like me. But on the other side, they understand these rules inside and out and 
I have friends that are former truck drivers that work for plaintiff attorneys to help them understand the mind of a truck driver and pick up on the little nuances that maybe an attorney wouldn't in your logbook, but a truck driver would say, oh, I know that you can't do those two towns in that time that he said, or I know that that's not a legitimate log because of X, Y, Z. Well, if you're involved in a crash where they think they can recover some money for an injured person, even when that person is not at fault, they're going to dig in and turn your life upside down. And like we talked about about the middle of the show, you gave them permission to do this when you started your trucking company because you agreed to be part of a highly regulated industry. I got so the that, link to that. Oh, I'm just going to say I got the link to the article in the live chat. This is a fascinating conversation, bro. I mean, honestly, today's show feels like the first time. <laughs> Well, that's an article that somebody, that everybody, it's recommended reading. Todd Dills did a fabulous job on Overdrive with that article, and it is recommended reading for everybody. I don't want to give you nightmares, but there's a lot more to this. Whether you are a driver or an owner, there is a lot more to this than just getting behind the wheel and driving every day and hoping nothing goes wrong. Uh, I have an article. It's Was it the February issue? No. It might have been January issue of American Towman magazine. I don't have it available in front of me, but I have an article on this about employee liability. Because just remember, even if you're an employee driver, just because your boss told you to do it doesn't mean that he's the one that's going to jail for it. In fact, I did an article online for Tow Industry Week uh, last month, Lessons from Lakewood, which are some lessons we all can learn about employee liability from that horrific crash where um, <coughs> Mr. Aguilera Medeiros failed to make sure his brakes were functioning, failed to use the runaway truck ramp, and killed four people, seriously injured six others, had the 110-year sentence that was commuted down to 10, his employer walked away scot-free, started a new trucking company, and life goes on. And Mr. Aguilera Medeiros is going to spend the least the next decade of his life in prison, and he will never work in the trucking industry again. He will have a hard time getting a job anywhere he goes. And it's tragic because he was just trying to feed his family, Maybe he had no business in the mountain. His employer surely did not train him the way he's supposed to, but he was just trying to be a good guy and go do his job like his boss told him. And that can bite us all in the butt at the end. And I lost your audio again. No, there it is, guys, because I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, Last thing I've got. All right. This is incredible stuff here today. We've got... All right. Do you... Yeah, I see these. Driving Fleet Profitability, the Carrier's Complete Guide. Um, I don't know. Is there anything in here, in here for the owner-operator, or is this kind of corporate I, stuff? What is this? I, ha I haven't looked through that particular report, but there's always a nugget of knowledge to be gained for the owner-operator. Sure, the owner-operator does not have the same efficiency of scale that a large fleet does, and you may retain truck drivers in a different way. You may manage your fuel consumption in a different way than a large fleet does. But there's always something in here that you can retain uh, or think about, especially if you're trying to grow your fleet and you're going to get bigger. Or you just want to compare your performance against the large fleets and see how much better you're doing than they are. Uh, so there, there's always something you can learn here. This particular report is really nothing more than a sales pitch. For I was just going to say, here it is. Yes. Yeah, here it is. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but to, yeah, I mean, th still, there, there is yeah. a point to that. Yeah. Cause if, if some of this stuff didn't work, the big fleets that are working on a, two to three percent profit margin wouldn't be spending their money on this yeah they with five thousand trucks if they make a couple of pennies extra off each truck that adds up to a lot at the end of the day and the end of the week and the end of the year uh but you manage your pennies and the dollars will mine themselves so that is really the takeaway from this yeah and there you go there it is it's on it's on page 17 of 18 but there's your summary your Stock shareholder summary. Yes. Interesting stuff. Um, well, I think uh, I think just this just in, 
uh, DOT compliance viewers sit up straighter in their trucks than the average driver. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a lot here. This is definitely, I, I named the title, it's here, Highly Regulated Business. Yes. That is the name of this show. That will be the name on the thumbnail. I'll update the uh, YouTube title. And, um, yeah, Ansys talk about, remember the Walmart accident on the New Jersey Turnpike? Walmart settled. I was just going to say, when it comes to the attorneys, um, you know, there's the personal opinion. But the, their ability to grind away at details and conduct discovery, uh, interrogatories, depositions motions i mean it's it is daunting if well, you get to that stage you understand that better than a lot of people given mm. some of the stuff you've done in the past and uh i work with the legal system and let's just close on this with the yeah. attorneys and plaintiff counsel and ants is absolutely right i remember that i remember that crash on the new jersey turnpike the driver hadn't actually done anything illegal he hadn't even violated any of walmart's company policies uh he was allowed to work at a distribution center that was something like 800 miles from his actual home address. So he drove down there off duty in his personal car, which was legal. He did not feel he was fatigued and impaired at the time when he got in his truck to drive. And he still had time left. It was only a few minutes, but he still had time left on his 14-hour clock in the truck after driving up to New Jersey from, I believe it was Georgia, uh, something like that. And he fell asleep. And here's a prime example of where all the safety technology in the world didn't help because that truck was equipped with uh, crash mitigation technology, driver alertness technology. It didn't help. That driver faced a prison sentence for something he did that he was negligent for because he fell asleep. He should have put himself out of service saying he was fatigued, but he didn't. Walmart paid a big price for it because they had a company policy that allowed him to do that. And everybody paid a price. Now, here's an example of an unfair one. We all love to pick on Swift, but Swift Transportation was just involved in a nuclear verdict last year, a $980 million settlement for a driver that did nothing wrong. Their driver was driving on, I believe it was I-10 down in Texas in an ice storm when a passenger vehicle traveling in the opposite direction drove across the uh, – drove across the uh, center median, hit their truck head on. There were severe injuries, maybe fatalities. I don't recall all the details. But the Walmart or the, the Swift driver did nothing wrong other than plaintiff counsel was able to use reptile theory and say that, well, he shouldn't have been there because he's the professional and knew it was icy and knew it was unsafe to be on the road. So my client, they're not a professional driver. They didn't know any better. They didn't know being Texas people, their car was going to slide off the road and across the median and hit that big bad tractor trailer that had just started his day and should have stayed in the truck stop. This is what you face with trucking lawsuits today. Reptile theory is so wild. What is reptile theory? Reptile theory is where they take the opposition and they reduce them down to something subhuman in the mind of the judge and the jury that that person isn't a person anymore. They were acting so callous with such careless disregard for everyone else's safety that they don't deserve any mercy any respect their opinion means nothing and we're just going to throw everything at the wall till it sticks because they're bad that that's my layman's uh, oh, so uh definition of it uh national uh party politics <laughs> now we but know what to call room. it reptile yes. theory yeah okay <laughs> got it okay good um, and on that, we can end that. That was one hour. That was awesome, Brian. Thank nice. you so much for all of that. Um, and want to thank everybody in the live chat for tuning in, asking questions. If you miss this show live, uh, well, we're sorry, uh, number one. And number two, make sure you uh, comment below. You can email Brian. We want to help. That's the whole point. We know you may not be able to tune in live, but we want to help. And um, so let us know how we can do that. And so, Brian, um, oh, next week we've got 
Is that when we have Truck and Fitness? Yes, we have a special guest, Mark, from Truck and Fitness. We're going to help, and this goes along the lines of your motor of your DOT medical card. We're going to talk about how truckers can be a little bit healthier, just incrementally, a few steps at a time, and how it can help you keep your medical qualification so that you can drive and help you stay alive so that you can enjoy the life that you are building for yourself and your family. Which is, I mean, right, we know. It's like everything else. Easier said than done. Um, and what Mark has done is he's got, you know, he's got helpful tips of places you actually eat. Right? Yes, and, and he's got an app that helps you work out with nothing special. You don't need to carry any special equipment in the truck with you. He helps you think about stuff that we're already stuck with eating as a truck driver anyhow, the McDonald's at the truck stop. What's the better solution, the the triple cheeseburger or the grilled chicken sandwich? What little changes can you make to go from a 1,000-calorie meal to a 400-calorie meal and simple things like that? And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, no, me too, because I know that, like, your the first step seems to be counting calories. Yes. And we're not, I think the average guy doesn't really do that. And no. so then when somebody points it out, okay, look at the side of the box, look at the calories, you start there, and then you learn more about looking at the sugar, looking at the sodium, um, looking at the protein, looking at the, the fat, and you start, as you start to do that, you realize you're going through a change, and you can either reject it, <laughs> or go, man, I need to look at this more. And then you go through the process, and then a week later you forget all about it, and you know, and you party, and you go tailgating. But at some point you come back, and you go, you know, I want to look at that again. And then there you are, looking at the fast food menu boards, and you start to see those numbers you never noticed before. Mm -hmm. The calorie numbers. And then you think, well, alright, so if I cut out one soda a day, and that's where Mark comes in, is he's going yes. to bring in the reasonable counting calories nothing crazy you know we're not gonna all be living on astronaut packets or whatever you know because it's not sustainable so right um uh, <laughs> and transportation canceled netflix <laughs> <laughs> because we got it all here at ati brian thank you so much it's you're welcome jay this week. it was a great see show everybody today. next wednesday all right, stay safe, stay warm, and let us know how we can help. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. All right, see you, buddy.